Uh, welcome to today's Ask Me Scott Skills webinar. Uh, today's presentation is Building Power, Organizing Around Workplace Issues. Tom Ellett, Field Education Coordinator for the Central Region, is your presenter for today's session. Thank you, Shondell. Hello, all. Uh, as Shondell said, my name is Tom Ellett, and I want to thank you for joining me for this webinar on organizing around workplace issues. You know, we all face problems in our workplaces, and the reason we've joined together in Ask Me is to have the power to address issues, to make the workplace better. Sometimes we utilize the grievance procedure, other times we address those issues through bargaining, but there's good reasons those might not be the best solutions to our problems or the best way to build union power. So today we're going to talk about direct action organizing and workplace issue campaigns. And to be clear, when I talk about organizing, I'm not talking about membership sign-up. That's recruitment. By organizing, I'm talking about engaging our coworkers in action to exert power in the workplace. And organizing will help with recruitment because the real value of direct action organizing is that it provides the best opportunity for your coworkers to become involved or more involved in our union and to demonstrate the truth of the proposition that the members are the source of our union strength. To that end, we're going to learn how to identify which issues might be suited to direct action organizing and how to develop a strategy based on those issues that will move the boss to address our needs. By the end of this module, you will understand the advantages of direct action organizing to address workplace problems, be able to identify good organizing issues, identify targets, create appropriate tactics, and develop effective strategies to win. Okay, well, let's get started. So as I've already said, when faced with a problem in the workplace, very often we'll file a grievance. And we call this using legal power. Or have the local president or staff rep try to work it out with the boss. We call this utilizing relationship power. Or we might tell folks we'll just have to wait for contract negotiations to come around again. But these approaches are not always the most timely or effective for either solving the problem or building the power of the union. Why is that? Because grievances can take too long. We go through the first step and then the second step and so on. And if the matter goes all the way to arbitration, it could be a year or more before the problem is resolved. And usually only the grievant even knows anything is happening during that time. Having the staff rep or local leader just work it out with the boss might solve the problem but it doesn't give members a sense of their power because they weren't a part of the solution. And waiting for negotiations to come around could mean the problem festers for years. And often these methods aren't very successful. We don't win the grievance because we don't have the best contract language or the staff rep can't work it out with the boss or we don't get what we want in negotiations because being right is not enough. It's not about being right or justice. It's about power. And although we had some good luck when the U.S. Supreme Court recently rejected Friedrich, there are a dozen more cases working their way up through the courts that could be even worse. And continuing anti-union attacks in state legislatures around the country may mean that we'll lose the ability to file grievances and negotiate contracts in the near future. So we need more tools in our union toolbox. And even if the courts and legislatures don't go that far, direct action organizing gives everyone an opportunity to be an active part of our union. It builds membership power as opposed to just legal or relationship power. It enhances communication with the membership, develops new leaders, and is often faster and more likely to succeed. Organizing around workplace issues can mean more work for the staff or leaders and it can be more confrontational than some people are used to, but it's worth it to build union power because that's what workplace organizing is all about, building union power in the workplace. Let's take a look at what it takes to do it. So when you break it down, there's really three steps to building union power. One, identify workplace issues. Two, develop an action plan to move the boss to address those issues, and three, agitate and mobilize workers around those issues they care about. So the first step is to identify potential issues to organize around. 
The Ask Me Strong five-step organizing conversation is a great way to do this. Um, uh, folks, could you give me a little feedback? We're going to uh, put up a, a, a polling tool. And if you could let me know how many of you have been through the Ask Me Strong activist training already. If you have, select yes. If you haven't, select no. Okay. Well, a large number of you haven't been through that training, so we're going to have to get that scheduled for you folks. Uh, for those of you who have been through the training, how many of you are using the formula when talking to your coworkers? If you're using the formula, select yes. If not, select no. Okay. So for those of you that have been through the training, you're using the formula, and that's great. Fantastic. But for those of you who haven't been through the training, or if you may have forgotten, we've been engaged for about a year in talking to our coworkers one-on-one -on -one to deepen the connection between our union and the members and to engage potential new members in order to grow our union. The Ask Me Strong Organizing Conversation is a framework made up of five steps. One, grab your coworkers' attention and create a sense of urgency that this conversation is important. Two, get the story. Through asking open-ended questions, we learn what our coworkers care about, what problems they may have, and what motivates them to take action. Three, by sharing our union vision, we posit our union as the solution to those problems and the means to making the workplace better. Four, based on the conversation we're having up to that point, we determine where our coworker is at and ask them to take some appropriate action on behalf of our union and themselves. And five, we're honest with our coworkers that building power in the workplace isn't easy. And there are many who oppose us. But if we all stand together, we can do it. So through Ask Me Strong, we've been identifying issues that are important to our coworkers. Remember, step two, we get the story. And we need to do something about those issues. Well, some of them will be appropriate as the basis for a workplace issue campaign. And that's what we're going to talk about now. In order for direct action organizing to work, it's very important to start with a workplace issue that is suitable for organizing members to take action. But not all workplace problems are good ones to engage and activate our members. Here are some criteria to consider. And if you're not taking notes, this checklist is available as a handout that you can download at the end of the webinar. So a good issue to organize around is one that's widely felt. And by that, we mean that it affects most people. Now, most of the people may mean the entire local union. But depending on the scope of the issue, it could mean just most of the people in a building. Or it could mean most of the people on a given floor, or even just most of the people in a department. A good organizing issue is also one that is deeply felt. That people should have strong feelings about the problem. They're angry about it and willing to do something to fix it. Good organizing issue is one that's easy to understand. There shouldn't be any question as to whether the problem exists. Another criteria for good organizing issue is one that's non-divisive. Avoid issues that divide the membership and those that might divide us from the clients or the public we serve. An ideal issue for organizing around is one that's winnable. Members should believe there's a good chance of winning ideally in a short period of time. A good organizing issue should have a clear, easily understood solution. Again, for the same reason as the problem should be easy to understand, so should the solution. And finally, a good organizing issue is one that's worthwhile and results in real improvements in the members' lives. It's important for the member to believe in the fight and see positive change as a result. Now, I'm not saying that an issue that doesn't meet these criteria isn't important. It's just not a good candidate for workplace organizing. So let's take a look at a situation faced by one of our locals and determine if there is an issue which presents a workplace organizing opportunity. Keep the checklist in mind as I read this scenario. 
During the summer months, the central air conditioning system in a building runs continuously. Employees come in from the summer heat to a building that is downright chilly. No one's comfortable. Some are even getting sick and having to use sick leave. It's a constant topic of discussion in the break room. The steward filed a grievance, but nothing happened. The steward didn't hold out much hope as the contract was silent on the issue. The department head has said that it's beyond his control to fix. So in this case, the issue is that the air conditioning system is making people uncomfortable and causing some people to get sick and lose sick time. But is it a good issue to organize around? Let's analyze it together. So again, we're going to put up that polling feature. I'm going to ask you some questions, and you can answer yes or no. First question, is this problem likely to be resolved with a grievance? If you think that it is, select yes. If you think that it's not, select no. Okay, most of you believe that this is not a good issue to be resolved by the grievance. Others of you may have better contract language than this local has, but the steward's already made an attempt to resolve this through the grievance procedure, and because of the contract uh, has made a determination that this is not going to be won through the grievance procedure. Okay, is the problem widely felt? You think that it is, select yes. If you think that it's not, Select no. Okay, most of you agree that it does appear that the issue is widely felt. This uh, issue of the temperature in the workplace seems to affect everybody. Is the problem deeply felt? If you think that it appears to be deeply felt by the workers, select yes. If not, select no. Okay, most of you think that it is deeply felt. I think that that's right, given that uh, it is the uh, constant topic of discussion in the break room, that uh, people are, uh, are quite concerned about this issue. Is solving this problem worthwhile? If you think that it is, select yes. If you think that it's not, select no. Okay, most of you think that it is worthwhile. We have a situation where not only are folks uncomfortable, but some are getting sick and having to use sick leave unnecessarily. So uh, it does strike me as an issue that's worth organizing around. Okay, final question. Is getting the temperature right winnable in a reasonable amount of time? If you think that this issue is winnable, select yes. If not, select no. Okay, well most of you do think that getting the temperature right in the workplace is winnable in a reasonable amount of time, and great, thank you everyone for that uh, participation. Now, this may seem like a relatively minor problem, and in some workplaces it would be, but I want you to keep three things in mind. One, as organizers, we don't get to determine which issues are important to our coworkers. They make that decision themselves. Two, Small problems are often overlooked as organizing opportunities, even though they often offer the best chances for victory. And three, the criteria for determining if a big issue is a good one for organizing around is exactly the same as for a relatively small issue. So it sounds like we have an issue to organize around. And let's develop now a strategy to move the boss in order to fix the problem. The first part of developing an action plan is to identify the person or persons who can fix the problem. We call that person the primary target. Avoid making large groups such as boards or the entire institution your target. That will tend to blur your focus. A secondary target is someone who can influence or compel your primary target to act. This person may be above your primary target, like your target's boss, or below the primary target, a respected underling or a colleague. 
And sometimes our tactics will be directed towards the primary target. Other times we will push the secondary target. So in the scenario we just reviewed, the building manager might be the primary target and the department supervisor might be a secondary target. Think about who these people might be if the scenario happened in your workplace. Okay, so now that we have an issue to organize around and we've identified our target, we need to develop tactics that pressure the target to do what we want. Tactics need to be appropriate to the issue. They need to be something that people will do, and they should be fun. The best tactics, like the examples listed here, give everyone an opportunity to participate. So things like a collectively signed grievance, or everyone wearing buttons, ribbons, or armbands, everyone wearing the same color clothes, or Ask Me t-shirts, Having folks sign a petition or march into work together at the start of the workday or attend a parking lot rally, all of those give the membership a chance to act together, to act in concert, as we say. Now, press releases, you see that very last one, for example, though, are not good tactics for our purposes because there's no opportunity for the members to participate in that. However, letters to the editor could be a good tactic if the letter writing was done at a meeting. Okay, now remember I said tactics need to be doable? Well, some tactics are more doable than others. That is, some tactics require more investment, and by that I mean effort or resources or even courage. So some tactics require more investment than others from the membership. An example of a typical low investment tactic might be everyone wearing a button in the workplace. While a march on the boss's office could be a moderate investment tactic, and certainly a strike is always a high investment tactic. But how doable a tactic is depends on the workplace. How much investment is de depends on the workplace. A workplace with a history of confrontation with the boss, or one that has a well-organized membership or a strong leadership, might think a parking lot rally is a low investment tactic, while a workplace new to direct action might find that tactic daunting at first. And the amount of investment to pull off a tactic changes as a campaign proceeds. People you get the tactic doesn't get the desired result, as long as people are participating and enjoying it. And as I said, tactics should escalate over time. This gives the members a chance to get used to participating in actions, to get comfortable with that idea, and it gives the boss the chance to do the right thing with minimal conflict. So this is the basis of strategy, and that's what we're going to examine further. But first, before we move on, please know that there are a couple of worksheets for developing tactics available for download at the end of the webinar. Okay, so a strategy for the issue we've been working on might be First, we have a membership meeting to discuss the problem and the steps we should take, followed by a petition to the building manager demanding the problem be fixed. If that doesn't get it done, then we put up cubicle posters saying, we're not giving you the cold shoulder, the building is. And if that doesn't do it, we have everyone wear a button or a sticker related to the issue, such as, this place makes me sick. If that doesn't do it, we have everyone come in to work wearing Ask Me Green earmuffs in the office throughout the day. And finally, if we still haven't gotten that problem solved, we have everyone confront the boss at his or her office wearing their cold weather clothes and demanding the problem be fixed now. So you can see each tactic might last a day or even a week, as long as people are participating and having fun. But a good tactic that goes on too long becomes a drag. Now, some things to think about when developing your strategy. Good strategy is motivated by urgency. We face urgent challenges. We have opportunities that will disappear if we don't take advantage of them. And in that moment of urgency, we can define a specific goal and commit to it. And the strategy follows from that commitment. Begin by thinking about what resources you have. Figure out what you need to shift the relation of power. Tactics should be chosen based on whether they effectively use our resources to build power. Remember, good tactics are ones that involve lots of people and build participation in our union. 
We're usually challenging people and institutions who have more power and economic resources than we do. So we've got to be creative to make up for the gap. So in the example above, having folks wear winter clothes in the workplace during summertime made a dramatic and highly visible statement. And people thought it was really fun. A good strategy is rarely created by one person alone. The members of your team bring different per, uh, experiences and perspectives and resources to the table and take advantage of the opportunity to develop a smarter strategy by drawing on all of that, just like we did in the example above, starting with a group meeting. And finally, strategy is something we do. It's not something we have. Good strategy means being nimble and flexible, responding to circumstances as they happen. We've got to learn from our experience and change it up as we go. Okay, so now that we've identified an issue around which to organize, we've identified targets, we've developed a strategy of tactics, the only thing left to do is to do it. And that's where the fun really begins. But so let's do another skills check to see if everyone has the basics down. So this time, the questions are going to be true or false. So let true, you agree with the statement, false if you disagree. The best way to get members involved in our union is to always have the staff rep work things out with the boss. Do you think that that's true or that's false? Great. 100% of you agree that that is false. That's right. Always having the staff rep work things out reinforces the idea that the union's a third party and it relies on relationship power, not membership power. Okay, another question. A good issue to organize around is one that a lot of people really care about. Is that true or false? Okay, most of you agree that a good organizing issue is one that is both widely felt, right, a lot of people, and deeply felt, something that people really care about. Great. Next question. We should organize around issues that we have a chance of winning. Is that true or false? Okay. Most of you agree that we should pick issues that we have a good chance of winning. Now, as I said before, um, you know, sometimes we do have to take on issues that we're on the defense, that maybe we're not likely to win. And I'm not saying that we don't take on those issues. But if we're being proactive, if we're trying to identify issues that are likely to build a union, having one that shows some success is a good idea. Next question. The agency or the company is always the target of an issue campaign. True or false? Great. Most of you uh, agree that that is uh, false. But again, remember our primary target and our secondary target are people who have either A, the power to give us what we want, that's the primary target, or B, to influence our primary target, and that's the secondary target. Okay. Clever posts on social media are the best way to make members feel empowered. Do you think that that's true or false? Okay, most of you think that that is false. I, I agree with that. Um, you know, I'm not saying that we don't use social media, uh, but again, using only social media as the means of building the union uh, just gives the impression that the union's a third party. It doesn't give the membership a sense of their own power. All right. Some tactics are harder to get people to do than others. Some tactics require more investment. True or false?
That's right. Not all tactics are created equal. Some are harder to get people to do. And you certainly don't want to start with a high investment tactic right off the bat. Okay. But once people get used to doing workplace actions, they're more willing to be bold. Do you think that that statement is true or false? Right, 100% true, that's right. As people participate in tactics and actions, they become comfortable uh, and that a tactic that may not be possible today might be possible later on in a campaign. So a related question, tactics should escalate over time. Is that true or false? Okay, most of you agree with that statement. Tactics should escalate over time, again, because it gives people an opportunity to become comfortable with them, and it also gives the boss the opportunity to do the right thing without having to be engaged in a really dramatic confrontation with the union. Final question, we shouldn't allow non-members to participate in our campaign until they sign a membership card. Do you agree with that or not? Interesting. I thought this might be a little controversial, but all of you agree that, you know, participating in a issue campaign, uh, participating in tactics or actions can be a pathway for people to become members of our union. And again, we want to demonstrate to the boss that all the workers are united around an issue and that there's nothing that divides us. Great. Well, fantastic. Great job, everybody. So I hope I've demonstrated that workplace issue organizing is a great opportunity for your coworkers to become involved in our union and to demonstrate the truth of the proposition that the members are the source of our union strength. We've learned how to identify which issues might be suited to direct action organizing and how to develop a strategy to move the boss to address our needs. If you'd like some more information about direct action organizing, the Ask Me Stewards Handbook and the Ask Me Officers Handbook have detailed information on analyzing issues and strategizing. Both are available online uh, at uh, the Ask Me website. There's also a video called Power at Work, which weaves together the stories of a real Ask Me local and has actors demonstrating how a collective action campaign is carried out and how it builds the union. A book you may have heard of before called Troublemaker's Handbook, published by Labor Notes, has a lot of great collective action ideas and how to build strong locals. And the Activist Cookbook, published by United for a Fair Economy, is like a recipe book for action with a lot of creative, creative ideas you can use. Those last two publications are available through your local bookstore. And uh, remember, there's uh, uh, some checklists and some worksheets for you to download uh, here by clicking on the handout tab located on your attendee panel. And if you have any questions, concerns, or doubts about this in the future, don't hesitate to contact your local leadership or staff. And I want to thank everyone for attending this webinar. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed it, and I, I hope that you did too. So again, Tom, I want to thank you for um, delivering this uh, well put together presentation. Uh, the information was um, awesome. <laughs> okay, thanks everyone.